Good morning. Let's begin our session number seven with prayer. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. I am grateful once again for your grace, and at the same time, the ability and the opportunity you've given to me and others here to extend that grace to others in our workplaces. May it be so, and may we learn once again from your scriptures how that is to happen. We thank you for Jesus, for it's in his name we pray, amen. Well, uh, we are on the back side now. This is episode number seven out of 12, and we are moving down the road toward the great finale. By the way, next, the next two weeks, uh, we've been talking about work, obviously, vocation as ministry is all about work. The next two weeks, we're actually going to talk about rest, which I think is one of those undertaught areas of life. So we're going to spend two weeks on that and go back to Genesis, of course, Genesis 2, 1 to 3, and highlight those important ideas. But this week, we are going to return to our vocation is ministry emphasis, and we repeat this on the top of all of our handouts, by the way, which are in the back, and if you need one, uh, feel free to go grab one of those. But everything that we have been uh, given has been given by God, and it is not ours, uh, it is His, and so we operate within the framework of the uh, world that He has given us to live within. I, I begin this week with, in an unusual way, and that is to highlight for us uh, a certain individual and his work. Uh, his name is Frederick Law Olmsted. Frederick Law Olmsted was the man who designed Central Park in Manhattan, what you see in front of you here on the screen. Central Park was something not only that he designed uh, in one time and place, this was not a one-and-done kind of thing, but he had 30 different uh, architectural opportunities that he did in various parks and places around the United States. In fact, if you're so inclined to this, uh, one of the other websites that I maintain is my old website, warpandwoof.org. That's W-A-R-P-A-N-D-W-O-O-F.org. And you can go, or just type in Olmsted, Frederick Law Olmsted, and find my review of a book that I uh, reviewed some time ago, I think it was back in 2011, on his very life. The title of this book is The Genius of Place, The Life of Frederick Law Olmsted. And one of the things, and you'll notice this if you go to my, uh, that website and you look this uh, review up, you'll notice in that particular review I'm asking this question. At the same time, he's ta I'm talking about the monuments and wildlife parks and so on, all of these things that he, are so wonderful. At the same time, there are deep concerns about how humans live in God's world. How much do we create or recreate along with creation? So when you're looking at Central Park and Manhattan, and you consider the beauty of this, and you realize that you can't build any buildings in this park, that this is set aside, can we create within the created world that other people have created? So I highly recommend uh, going and doing a little bit of study on Frederick Law Olmsted and his work, not only in Central Park, Manhattan, but just generally speaking in parks and preserves in and around the United States. His work is phenomenal, and uh, his place in history uh, ought to be something that we celebrate. Because if we are really concerned about the life that we say we live as Christians, then we are going to be concerned about the reclamation of work. We'll talk about what that means, but in a normal way, I would like to introduce you to a few movies if you've not heard of these before. One of them is Babette's Feast, which is based on a book by one of my, uh, well, I've read this book, I think, back in the 1980s, uh, along with Out of Africa by the, the author Itzhak Denison. I love uh, her writing. Yeah, it's fantastic stuff. You may have seen the movie Out of Africa with Robert Redford. Well, Babette's Feast is this marvelous story about a woman who has been given a refuge by a small group, a minority of people in a certain place, and she extends her uh, gratitude to them by creating a feast. Uh, and It's something, if you've not read the book, if you've not seen the movie, I highly recommend it. It's just a marvelous work highlighting the reclamation of creation. Now, right along with that, a more perhaps modern story is uh, that of a food truck. 
and John Favreau uh, did this film. Uh, always whenever I uh, talk about movies, and I write about this on my Friday emails to folks that I send out, uh, always check IMDb for your own personal convictions, the things that you can uh, deal with in life. I, th I think in this particular case, the language might be a little rough in places. But this is a great story. It's a great story about family. It's a great story about work. And I highly recommend it. Uh, really a positive, joyous experience uh, as you see people navigate through the difficulties of life. And then to the true horse whisperer. Okay, Robert Redford played the horse whisperer. Uh, this is the real guy. In fact, he was on the set when Redford was doing this. He actually knows how to speak to horses and get horses to uh, acclimate themselves uh, to humans, but I should probably reverse that. I think he would say getting humans to acclimate themselves to horses and treat horses better uh, than they should or than they should have been doing uh, right along. Uh, a really great documentary, and once again, another one of those that I would highly recommend. And then if you're into rom-coms, here's New in Town. Now this is, you know, the usual kind of stuff that you might see with folks uh, like Renee Zellwinger. Uh, here she is the manager of a factory, and she finds out that when she moves to this place, which is in the upper Midwest in Minnesota, that it's a whole different ball game than where she comes from on the coastline. And what she learns isn't so much about how to be a leader, but how to be herself and what that necessarily means. And I want to drive home this idea of reclamation. One of the things that I do regularly, every single session that I have with my students uh, at IEPY as I'm teaching, reading, writing, and inquiry, we do every single day is etymology. That is the history and background round of terms and words and why they're so important. In this case, the word reclamation is important because it means back to the original place. So it was a Latin term. It means back to the original place. We want to always go back to Genesis to find out what it was that God's original intention was so that we might reclaim it and that we might practice the kinds of things that we have been taught in the scriptures. So you've seen this every single week, I believe I put this slide up, that everything is sacred. And so our concern about the redemption and the reclamation of life is to understand that no matter who you are, no matter what you do, that we are doing sacred things. That this concept that we have here, even this morning, on a Sunday morning, worship. Worship isn't something you just do on Sunday for an hour and a half a day or maybe a couple hours if you go to teaching. Uh, this is something that we just normally do because it's part of who we are in our life as Christians. Why is that? Another slide from the past. Because we have emphasized that Scripture teaches that all things not only come from God, are His, but that they have been given to us for our benefit. And this is a real important idea, once again, that runs through every single thing that I would teach uh, but certainly through this particular session as well. Now, on your handouts, there are five major principles. I mentioned that we're reclaiming, going back to the original place. We're going back to Genesis. There are five major principles. I was in a uh, pastoral mood and decided for alliteration. So they all start with R, and uh, you can follow along there on the handout if you'd like, but also, obviously, on the screen. The very first idea that comes out of Scripture and the importance of the fact that we humans bear the image of God, these five principles come out of that teaching of the Imago Dei, the image of God in all of us as human beings. No matter who we are, believers, unbelievers, doesn't matter. So, in the ancient Near Eastern world, that's what A-N-E stands for, only kings were made in the God's image. So this meant that if you saw the king, that you were looking at God. Now, we have seen this in modern times. We saw this during World War II, for instance, when you had uh, the emperor Hirohito, uh, when he was thought of as a god by the Japanese people. You see this regularly in other cultures as well. But the whole point of this is that what was going on in the ancient world, it's nothing new. It continues today. We see the same kind of superior attitude of uh, bosses and people who think they're better than us because they might be another rung up on the ladder or whatever the case might be. In this case, however, the scriptures teach plainly that because we are all image bearers of God, 
we are all the representation of God wherever we are, whatever our workplace might be. So we need in this culture and in every culture to communicate what it means to be human. So when people ask me about what does it mean to teach in a public university campus and how do I navigate some of the sexual identity issues, I just smile and say, I ask my students, you know, if they have questions about, are you a human person? Well, yes. Well, then we're good. Well, let's just go on with life, you know. It's okay. You know, the other stuff, we'll chat about that, but, you know, you're human. So am I. So let's go. Let's talk about that first. So we are the representation of God. By the way, I'm using the phrase kings and queens a la C.S. Lewis and Narnia uh, because C.S. Lewis, of course, highlighted those, that kind of concept that, uh, that as these young people were going through Narnia that they were the kings and queens of Aslan's country. And so we are. And by the way, if you go to the black culture today, you will hear, especially in the black culture, you, you will hear people uh, refer to men as kings and women as queens. So that's just a normal occurrence. That is a, a normal cultural pattern that takes place in different places. Maybe not so much in ours, but uh, in other places it might be. It might be something to consistently uh, remember as we think about how other people talk about themselves and others within uh, their groups. The next idea here, the second idea of the Imago Dei or the image of God and man is that we are his representative. We are not only his representation, we are the, Im the images of God, but we are now his representative. We stand in his place. If that's the case, then wherever we are, there God is. I'll say that again. Wherever we are, there God is. We literally are the representation of God, and we are also his representatives. And we are him in the place that we are at. So when you read places like uh, 1 Corinthians 11, for instance, verse 1, where Paul says, uh, imitate me as I imitate Christ. The whole point of the whole issue of imitation is you're imitating someone, not me, but you're imitating the one that I represent. That's the concept. So, in the ancient world, fascinating. In the ancient world, the responsibility of the individual king of that particular era was to create as many statues of himself as possible so that he could be everywhere present. This is kind of like 1984 and Big Brother. Kings needed to keep their power. And in order for them to keep their power, they'd put statues up everywhere of themselves so that people would constantly be, be reminded Big Brother might be watching. See, even Big Brother isn't a new concept. I mean, this has been going on for millennia. So this concept of the image of God, we are God in the place that we are at, that's what the image of God means for us. Now, there are some in our culture, uh, namely some of the students that I teach, who think that they would much rather be an Instagram influencer than they would be an astronaut, which is fascinating because the whole focus is really turned on themselves. Literally, they literally turn the cameras on themselves, and they are wanting to be an influencer. That means that if some advertiser comes along and sees that they have 100,000 followers, hey, I'm going to tag into this influencer, and I'm going to pay them to produce or to push my produce on everybody else out there because they have this much influence. Well, maybe. I mean, it is something. It is true that there are influencers in our culture. My question is always the same. What are you trying to influence for? Are you just trying to line your pocketbook? Is this your job? Well, yeah, for some it is. But it is something to consider. What is the reflection for? Is it focused on self, or is it focused on something or someone else? The third idea here is that we are royalty. So the ancient Near Eastern world, uh, they wore crowns, and they literally wore crowns of leaves. So if you go back to Psalm chapter 8, you'll see this very clearly, that we have been given this crown, and this crown has been given to us by the Lord, and this crown is representative of our kingship that has been given by the king. It is a sign of authority. It is a sign of glory 
So when we think about our responsibility, we literally not only are his representation, his representative, but we are royalty, and hence the idea of kings and queens. The fourth idea here is that we are in a realm, we are in a place, like Frederick Law Olmsted, for instance. Our place is very important, wherever it is that we are. And so, because in the Scriptures, it was the Scriptures were vying against other worldviews in the book of Genesis, so we are up against worldviews that totally disagree with our position or direction that we take life or think about all of life. We need to think about life in a very different way, that all of creation is given by the Creator, and it's our responsibility within this place to take care of the things that He has given to us. Go back to all of these other uh, episodes that we've done in the past on work and highlight that idea of place. We round out this, these five principles by talking about responsibilities. This kind of should be a, a little bit obvious, so forgive me for making the obvious plain here, but the idea was that in the ancient world, these kings and queens, they weren't nice. They were totalitarian rulers. Pick any totalitarian ruler of, the, of our day. They think of Russia or China or North Korea or Iran. They're all essentially the same. Nothing has changed in millennia from the tyrants who were then to the tyrants who are now. They thought that their power was their own. The problem, of course, is that we must answer to another person and that the things that have been given to us are not our own and that we do not function by ourselves, but we function under the authority of this one. Now, the applications abound for these five principles, and I'm sure that many of you are already on your way to thinking about, hey, I can see myself in this particular place. I've felt those kinds of issues in the past, or maybe you're in charge of folks and uh, you've been given the responsibility of administration, and you, you feel the, the compulsion of some of these ideas. Well, hang on, because we're going to make an awful lot of applications from here on out. One of the first ones is what I read in the New York Times uh, just in the last couple of weeks. This makes me shake my head, especially when I read and, went and read all their stats. Uh, without a college degree, life in America is staggeringly shorter. I have real problem with it with their English phrase there, staggeringly shorter, but you know, we'll let that go. I won't mark it with a red pen. But in this particular case, I'm going to ask the question, is this true? Well, I read through the article and they're saying, well, if you don't have a college degree, there are all kinds of reasons why people might die sooner than other people. And it doesn't always connect to having a college degree or not. Seriously, man, go take a stats course. That's what I want to say to folks sometimes. So whenever I see stuff like this, I always think about Mike Rowe. You all know Mike Rowe, dirty jobs guy? You know, Mike's really cool. He gets in there and gets in the dirty jobs thing, and there's all kinds of videos about Mike. But when I think about people that are day in, day out, doing good work, and they get dirty, I mean literally physically dirty doing their work, and they still like it, that's a good thing. Listen to what Mike Rowe has to say about going to college, by the way. And speaking of that, this was an article from two years ago. This comes from Forbes in, in 2021. Hang on, I'm going to come back to 2023 in a, in a second. Why companies should remove college degrees requirements from job listings. Okay, this is two years ago. So their Forbes are already way ahead of everybody. They're saying, you know, look, is this something we should even need in a resume for some of the jobs we have available? And the answer is, U.S. companies increasingly eliminate college degrees as a requirement amid out-of-control school costs. And then, of course, the subtext to all of this is based on a technology process where do you necessarily have to go to college for all of this? Well, that's a question mark. Notice the underlying statement there. Now investing in talent by embracing boot camps, apprentice, and skill-based learning programs. Well, finally, somebody got a clue. I had a student... Uh, this is just, this galls me no end, but it's a story to tell in this regard. I had this kid who, he's writing a paper. I mean, think about this. You're writing this to a professor who's assessing your work. And this guy says, my dad has told me that I don't need this course. And I'm going, well, why are you here? That's what I want to say. What are you doing here in my class? 
I think he actually ended up dropping out. And, you know, frankly, I'm glad, not because, you know, he ticked me off or anything, but because, frankly, if you don't need to be here for the job that, by the way, your dad's paving the road for, and you're, he's going to hire you because he's the head honcho and you're his son, great, no problem, I get that. But don't be telling me my classes not any, have any value, seriously. Uh, you still need people to actually learn how to write and communicate. That might be an important idea. Nonetheless, do you necessarily need to go to college? That's a real question being asked across the board for some years now, and this is the latest stuff just from uh, this past week. So, I want to go back, though, to the intention of God and the specific concerns of reclaiming work, and I want to begin this way. I want to talk about work as originally intended for human good, and yes, and I, the reason why I use the word uh, dirty robes here is because, you know, sin has inhibited everything. We talked about how sin is trauma on work a couple of weeks ago. And now we come back to this, but understand, understanding that sin's messed everything up, look at the last thing I've written here. But work gives meaning to life, providing pleasure as a gift of God. And just as a side note, not that I need to necessarily say this to anybody, but quite frankly, isn't it a good thing? Don't you, how do you feel when you get done with work in a day and you've accomplished these things and you have this sense of completion, of, wow, you know, I can go to bed tonight and sleep well, hold my head high because I worked really hard today. Think about the person who's washing uh, dishes all day or the person who's waiting tables all day or the person who's changing diapers all day or whoever or whatever uh, the case might be, whatever position or, that they're in. The goodness of working with one's hands, I think, has tremendous value. And here's the verse, or verses, I should say, that I used to sign college yearbooks with, high school yearbooks. What I have, I have seen to be good and fitting is to eat and drink and find enjoyment in all the toil with which one toils under the sun, the few days of his life that God has given him, for this is his lot. Everyone also to whom God has given wealth and possessions and power to enjoy them and to accept his lot and rejoice in his toil, this is the gift of God. For he will not much remember the days of his life because God keeps him occupied with joy in his heart. And I've highlighted this uh, those two words, the joy and the enjoyment of heart. We don't... Look, bad stuff happens to all of us. Okay, let's just put that out there. With that said, at the same time, we have to say, when we have a job that we are compelled by, that has our best interests at heart, we're feeding a family, uh, even if it's, it's that but we have a job perhaps that we enjoy, what does it do for us? It occupies us. It occupies our minds. I was talking with my daughter recently uh, who has four kids. I mean, that's enough to occupy your mind right there. And two of them are twins. I mean, this is a whole discussion point. But they switch to homeschooling, and they've got this whole regimen, and every single day is different than the next day, and she said to me, Daddy, you know, once, once the day begins and I know what I'm supposed to be doing, I just go and do that thing. And it occupies my mind. I don't think about other things. And that's good. That's a good thing. And we should be really grateful for those things. We should be grateful for work. So, this is, uh, I get HBR uh, emailed to me every day, five days a week. HBR is the Harvard Business Review. So I pick up on some things. I just wanted you to notice, this was this week, and I want you to notice number four at the bottom here. They give you all these different articles. And one of them is, creating a happier workplace is possible and worth it. <laughs> well, guess what? People want to enjoy work. I mean, this should be like a no-brainer. Well, duh, a Homer Simpson moment here. And at the same time, we recognize that everybody wants to enjoy work, but guess what? Christians can speak into this concept of joy and enjoyment of work and labor. And we should be doing that because we actually have a reason for this, which makes me want to launch into a philosophical diatribe about reason and meaning and purpose. But the whole point of this little slide here is to highlight the fact that Christians are way ahead of the ball game, and we ought to practice and promote 
that enjoyment and work mentality. All right. So, why should we reclaim work? Because without it, the result is poverty. And then Proverbs speaks about laziness. But notice what I've underlined here. When offered in service to God, work is not bondage, but a joyful, liberating experience. That's what Deuteronomy 28, 47 says. As I mentioned uh, earlier, there is no better feeling than to lay your head down at night and to know, you know what? I had a good day. I accomplished all of these things. So this morning, some of you are going to just smile and shake your head when I tell you this. Uh, you know, yes, I was reading my Bible this morning, but I was also uh, reading Fortune. <laughs> uh, I just read a lot of different stuff. Anyway, so this morning I read about this guy. His name is David Meads, and he is the head of Cisco in the UK, okay, Great Britain. Now, Cisco, for those of you who might not be assured of this, this is an IT corporation, and they highlight various responsibilities, one of which is cybersecurity, and they do all kinds of things with IT. But this guy started up that ladder when he was 16, 17 years of age. There's a whole story about him. It literally just came out this morning, so it popped up on my screen when I'm, I'm preparing for this morning, and I thought, you know, I need to mention this to everybody, because this guy really has some biblical proverbial wisdom here. Imagine that, being made in the image of God, that he would have a little bit of proverbial wisdom from uh, the scriptures. Uh, this is some really important stuff he says here. Here's just one quote. For me, attitude and aptitude are more important than whatever letters you have after your name. Oh, man. <laughs> but, I, but I like to say that to some of my professor colleagues. Um, you know, seriously, you can be in a job and do a lousy job at your job and just because you got all these letters, that don't mean squat, man. It's just not there. So can you do the job? That's what everybody wants to know. Anyway, this is a really good article. His name is David Meads, M-E-A-D-S, for those of you who are interested in this. Fortune Magazine, uh, the CEO uh, the, er, in uh, the UK of Cisco Corporation. So can we be enjoying life and enjoying the work that God has given to us? Absolutely yes. I mentioned this a moment ago. Statements from both Testaments indicate that work should be understand, understood as worship. So if you ask me what my definition of worship is, here it is in bold. The total response of the total person to our Lord Jesus Christ. That's my response to worship. I love, you know, what we do here in terms of uh, worship, folks that are involved in the worship process, uh, on a Sunday morning, but the definition of worship coming out of Scripture has to do with the total nature of life, not a specific time period on a Sunday. So, worship is to be done every day, in everything, in every moment of every day, and that's our responsibility. Scripture is very, very clear about our responsibility in worship. So, do we think about these ideas? I'm just going to read, read the screen here. Indeed, the word for work in the First Testament is the same as tilling the soil in Genesis 2. Isn't that fascinating? Collective worship or a general statement of life dedicated to serving God. So i got to ask the question, do we even think about this stuff when we're working? I mean, if we truly have a biblical Hebraic Christian worldview, which we talked about last fall in this class, if we're thinking Christianly about all things, do we think this way? Because this is what Scripture teaches about how we're supposed to think about work. There it is. These are the kinds of mental attitudes that ought to be part of our mindset and that grip us and motivate us and compel us in the workplace no matter our responsibility or our position uh, in the company. So, work honors the one who makes life possible. And this is going back to something I started with in week one and two, which is that we have a great commission that comes out of Genesis 1, which is Genesis 1.28. And that is that God has given us this world to work in, to manage and conserve. The words that are translated in Genesis 1.28 are subdue and have dominion over, but those Hebrew words mean to manage and conserve, to take care of what's been given, and then to manage it to produce. So... I'm sure I've uh, mentioned this before in some other venue, but it's worth saying again. 
uh, because I work with a lot of different ministries on campus and a lot of different folks doing really good work on the campus where I'm at. And at one juncture, one of the folks there uh, asked me this question, how do you do evangelism on the public university campus? And I smiled and said, I write really good peer-reviewed journal articles. Now just let that hang in the air for a moment. The point of my statement is, what, in my context, what do the people esteem in my context? They esteem education and academics. What do they expect out of me? Education and academics. What are they most going to look at and respect? Well, probably peer-reviewed journal articles. So when I was going through my degree there, that's what I was writing. I was churning out one of those every single year. They take a huge amount of time to do. But my point and emphasis is that that gives me an opportunity to speak with people that wouldn't listen to me otherwise. So there's this groundwork of respect that you establish with folks uh, in the world in which you're in. And you're, by the way, your worlds are different than mine, obviously. So I'm just telling, giving you examples from my world. Your world's totally different. So what do people respect in your world so that you might go and do those kinds of things and demonstrate that kind of a foundation of respect and then have that opportunity to speak into the lives of those individuals. So the whole, this is the last sentence there and the slide, the whole of the Christian life, labor, work, endurance, is to be subject to and energized by love, uh, faith, love, and hope, First Thessalonians tells us. And by the way, in Second Thessalonians, uh, Paul gets pretty upset with the Thessalonians when he says, you know, I found out that some of you uh, aren't working, you're just waiting for the Lord to return, and his comment is, if you don't work, you don't eat. Yeah, check that out, Second Thessalonians chapter 3. Well, there are some in the business world, this is from HBR, Harvard Business Review, just this month, and this is a guy writing about change and the need to think about new things. He writes, the ability to see unexpected and unwanted change from a place of hope, gee, I wonder where he got that might from, rather than fear, and as an opportunity to learn and grow, hmm, rather than to change. So get ready for change, whatever change is, because it's coming your way, like a freight train. And sometimes it hits you, and then you got to change again because it's hit you. So these kinds of things are simple for us, I think, as Christians, if we think differently about how we're actually supposed to live in this world. And so in this, uh, in this video series that I did, uh, what box leadership? This is what I define as anticipatory leadership, and that's seeing what's around the next corner. Leadership sees the future through people, and I think that's the important part of anticipating leadership for the future. What people do we need in the positions uh, of responsibility for our company, for our workplace, whatever, so that they can begin to see the future? Go back to my slide about the influencers. You know what we need? Yeah, sometimes in our, our workplaces, are younger minds because they think totally different than I do. And I want to have them around me. That's why I love teaching 18 and 19-year-olds because I learn so much from them. And the idea here is that I can see the future sometimes through the kinds of things that my students are talking about. Just for instance, uh, this last paper just got handed in this last week. And one of the students in my class is writing about how the automobile industry has basically, has basically told cities how they should be built with lots of parking lots. Why? Because everybody's got an automobile. So since the 1950s, the automotive industry has literally redefined what cities ought to look like with a lot of roads and a lot of parking lots. And what this young guy is saying is he's saying, hey, you know what? I think cities need to be more livable. I think they need to be walkable. I think we need to have cities that uh, allow for pedestrian thoroughfares and stuff like this. And I, he was talking with me about this paper. I said, have you ever re read Jane Jacobs? And he didn't know who Jane Jacobs was. I said, this is a really important woman in the early 20th century who's basically said the same exact thing you just told me. So go read Jane Jacobs and now think about how you're going to change cities for the future telling you, young minds, we need those folks around us. We get to the future through people. That's my emphasis. The, Im the image of God and people. We I want to go in so many different directions here, but 
I want to focus the attention on the image of God in people because if we have image bearers of God, whether they be believers or not, they think differently and think progressively in the proper sense of progressively. They're forward-thinking people about what do they see as problematic and how are they going to address changes that might happen or should happen in the future. Just some errant thoughts from Mark's fevered brain this morning. So, one of the classic questions I was always asked in any high school class where we ever talked about eternal issues was this question. What are we going to be doing for all eternity? And my students were always chagrined by my answer because Scripture's pretty clear. In the new earth, God's children will long enjoy the work of their hands. <laughs> The kings of the earth will bring their glory to it, the glory and the honor of the nations. They discovered that, you mean we're going to be working for all eternity? Yeah, I said, we're going back to the original intention of God in Genesis 1 and 2. What, where was work instituted? It was pre-fall, it was before sin, it's Genesis chapter 2. That's what we're going to be doing, and it's going to be great. They weren't, they weren't taking the passion there at any point. But nonetheless, this is the end result of all of this. Now, some of you may have been here, the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. This is the exterior, or at least one shot of the exterior. Look at this beautiful artifice. I mean, this is just a magnificent building. And when you go inside this building, this is one of the great halls, and I emphasize one of. This is just humongous. It, you feel like a dwarf in this Metropolitan Museum. And I've not been there. I just felt it through the pictures. But for the work story this week, by the way, I'm still looking for work stories. If you're so inclined, you know, send me an email at the bottom of that page. This comes from the journal First Things, November 2023, if you want to go check this out. First Things is one of those things that I get at my house, and I highly recommend it to everybody. First Things, November 2023. The title of the article is The Men Behind the Met. This is the opening story. My grandfather died before I was born, and he remains to me a mostly mysterious figure. As is true of many people born poor who were committed to bettering their lot, his hours were taken up with work, family, and church. Not much was left for that luxury item we call personality. A big man with paws for hands, in 1926, he got a job with a consolidated gas company as a digger, busting up roadways and digging trenches for the laying of pipe. With his wife, he raised six children in a two-bedroom apartment on 145th Street in the South Bronx. During his working life, he went to Mass on Sundays. During his brief retirement, he went to Mass every day. When I asked, people would tell me, your grandfather was a very good man. He left behind few stories. But one story about him has stayed with me. He worked six days a week, but on some Sunday afternoons, he would take the subway into Manhattan and visit the Metropolitan Museum of Art. He often went alone because no one else in the family wanted to go with him. But his most frequent companion was my mother, who, as the fifth child and fourth girl, was perhaps the least regarded member of the family and wanted attention. After he died, she reflected on those museum afternoons. And this is what she said. He didn't say anything. He would just walk through the gallery silently. He never pointed out particular paintings or statues or expressed any particular enthusiasm. I wish I had asked him why he went, but I never found that out. He must have gotten something out of it because he went over and over again. But he had no words. My mother was to study at City College and become an elementary school teacher. She would visit museums all over the world, sharing her thoughts about art with some, anyone who would accompany her. I have her journals. They're all about the art that she saw. Art became a part of our family life. And behind it all was my mother's unsatisfied curiosity about what motivated her father, the silent man in the museum. I now see one obvious reason why my grandfather came to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. He had been invited. A group of wealthy men had built the institution in the hope that men like my grandfather, ditch diggers, pipe fitters, bricklayers, and others who labored to manufacture, build, and repair, would learn of the glories of men and women who likewise worked with their hands 
because they were artists. Oh, man. That's just so cool. You walk through a building like this, you have no words. Why? Because you're mesmerized by the work of other people. So I've left us for five, with five questions, as I usually do. And here they are, the five questions. What kind of mindset do I have toward work? Do I have an emotional attachment to work? Is my work a joy? That's a good question. Why am I dissatisfied at work? Well, you flip the coin over and see the other side. Does incompletion now force me to consider completion then? So I don't see it now, that is during my lifetime, but can I anticipate something for the future? Now, I'm just going to pause and I'm going to say this to you. That the most important thing, uh, take back the word thing, the most important responsibility any of us have is to our children. Now, you may not have children, but whose ever life you come into contact with, that you have a mentorship or discipleship or uh, an influence in any way, is your child. I consider the thousands and tens of thousands of students I have had in my lifetime as my children because they have been with me and we've learned together. Those kinds of things are important. If you're responsible for a company or if you're responsible for your household, or it doesn't matter what you're responsible for. Whatever it is, that what you do now could be something that is benefited in the future when we're not even here. I think about that a lot. I think about how somebody might find my words and my works a hundred years from now if the Lord tarries and say, who was this guy who was writing all this stuff back then? How do I enact the representation of God as his representative at work? Where God, this is, God or is being seen by people because they're seeing you, image bearer of God. How do I use the authority given to me in my realm of authority? Because remember, administration is a charge, and that charge is a charge. That is, it's been given to us with authority, and I feel that with my students. My responsibility is to hold my authority in an open palm because as soon as I close it, it's power, and it becomes a fist, and I beat people with it, and that's not my job. And number five, how do I apply my responsibilities as a worker? So all of what we've suggested here today, the ideas of work and the uh, reclamation of it, to go back to the original place, that word means, is what we are to be about. And the stories and the examples that I've given, I hope, have been helpful uh, to us as we think about how to actually employ these ideas in the places that we are at. As always, uh, I'm grateful for your stories. Please uh, send them to me if you're so inclined. Chat with me later on, whatever. Uh, but until then, the next two weeks, we'll be emphasizing the concept of what does it mean to Shabbat, to rest. See you then.